Yeah, so um, as we just mentioned, um, I'm the director of the Center for African Language Diversity, and which is in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town. So I moved to Cape Town uh, five years ago, and I'm, I'm since there, since then I'm now permanent resident. And um, so I founded this center because for the reason just mentioned that uh, African linguistics is mostly done outside of the African continent by non-Africans. So uh, um, this center uh, has um, the, um, the motto or the main, uh, main intention is to have African linguistics established, which means African languages are studied by Africans on the African continent. So this is a, sounds like a very simple thing, but it doesn't happen. So, yeah, and um, this is my car. Uh, actually, I do have two cars. I also have a Land Cruiser, I must say. But So this is a, a language rescue car. So it says, uh, on the side here, it says endangered languages and then rapid response. And, um, and this is in the Northern Cape where some languages are spoken by a few hundred people only. And I work on, for the last three years, I worked on uh, Nu, which is spoken by three people only. And it's a completely distinct language. And uh, we just published this book, which is uh, meant for helping them to teach the language. Unfortunately, the three speakers are non-literate, so they always need collaboration and um, others to help them. OK, so my topic is I'm going to talk about the, the um, language situation, the legal and uh, policy realities uh, on the constitution, on the new constitution. So on the 2nd February of 1990, I was, that was my first time actually I was there while this happened. It was the first time to be in South Africa um, ever. And uh, I was there when this uh, happened and when Mandela was released. So I was witnessing this uh, important transition. And, um, and there were high expectations uh, when Mandela then won uh, and became the first president. And uh, the notion of R rainbow nation was uh, the slogan. And uh, his policy of national reconciliation managed to keep, to prevent a civil war. Because I don't know whether you remember, but at that time there were a lot of uh, there was violence basically all over the country. There were many people got killed and it was uh, on the brink of a, of a civil war. So the main intention of the policy and also the constitution has to be understood uh, in, in this context was to prevent a war. And, um, and he managed, I mean, the, the Mandela and the ANC managed to prevent this war, but at the same time it also... Uh, hindered the transformation of the nation. So that's what, what I'm, so there is a very crucial negative side effect and, and, uh, and that needs to be discussed uh, in, in further detail. So the constitution of, of uh, which was uh, then um, since 1996 is the legal basis for this vision of a new, uh, a freer and fairer society for all had to address the, the legacy of the apartheid times where widespread poverty, unemployment, and uh, then also land reform because the apartheid regime forced people into so-called Bantustans, so independent homelands, uh, which were, uh, and, and the realities are still there. And then uh, you had this deep, deep uh, mistrust among different races. Uh, which is still there. So there are, there, white and black are still don't trust each other. So they're all basically, I think 80% are proud to be South Africans. So the nation, so they identify with the nation, but they don't trust each other. And um, so the basic values of the constitution, which are, which are behind the constitution are then equality, dignity, accepting different cultures, Inclusion means including the black majority into and then freedom of speech. So this is uh, freedom and uh, freedom of speech. These are the background norms and values which are underlying the constitution and the design of the constitution. And, um, and then the constitution, as most of you know, now declares 11 official languages, which is unheard of. So nobody, no, there is no constitution in the world with 11 official languages. And, um, and then, in addition, though there are not only 11, 
So in addition, there are explicitly other languages mentioned, which also have a status, so they all have uh, a, a, other languages also need to be promoted by the government, and they have a right, including the South African Sign Language and, uh, and others. So, um, so before I start sort of criticizing the Constitution, I want to make sure, sure that everybody understands that I think this is a, a, a wonderful, a great, uh, a brave way to, to tackle the problem, especially knowing that the ANC, when they, they came into power, they wanted to have English only. They wanted to have English as the national language. And then because of the political situation of, of the, the violence also and the, and the resistance, uh, they had to listen to other people like Neville Alexander. And um, so he was quite instrumental and, and I'm going to mention him, his work and, and his uh, input uh, briefly later. So, um, so when you look at the constitution, it, it, it mentions linguistic diversity, on, lang, lang, uh, it deals with linguistic and, and, and cultural diversity <clears throat> um, as a reality, but not really as a, as a resource. So there is hardly any real positive, I mean, the, the underlying thing is to manage diversity. It's not to really use it, in, in, to use it as a resource, though this is one of the problems which I see. And... Um, and um, it says that all languages should be promoted, not only these 11. And um, so pointing towards multilingualism. So before I, I, I discuss the constitution, I first have to, to mention the languages which are spoken in, the, in Africa, so because pro probably most of you don't know. Uh, now, there, one, one other language which, ha which received official recognition is uh, Tram, which became extinct in the 19, 20, 1928. There were still some semi-speakers. Um, and it's the language which is used in the Code of Arms. So the Code of Arms, uh, the motto of the Code of Arms is in Tram, an extinct language. <clears throat> and um, President Mbeki, um, when he... Uh, um, when, when, when this was officially declared, he gave this speech and he said, this is, uh, they choose this language because it's the ancient language of our people. So, this, the, uh, come were hunter-gatherers. So, he's, he's not a hunter-gatherer. So, there is a, it's, it's sometimes this identity in South Africa is, is a quite complex thing. So, they identify themselves with come uh, and the motto e so there are these clicks, sounds, um, should mean something like um, a diverse people unite. But it was, uh, it was this, this phrase was coined by, by an archaeologist uh, using a dictionary. So this, probably this sentence was never used in this way. But, so, and now it's on the coat of arms, it's on the money everywhere, and... Um, yeah, so it's, it's a very important symbol. So everybody knows now uh, Tram and uh, know the history. And actually, the, the last three speakers of uh, Nu, the ones here, so she's the youngest, she's 84. So they are the last speakers of a, of a related language. So when they die, this entire language family is gone, so there are no people speaking a related language to Tram. And... Uh, Okay, so, and this is uh, the former situation. You see this blue color. Uh, the, basically, most of, of Southern Africa was, uh, of South Africa was uh, spoken, uh, uh, and was spoken there. And then, uh, here, there is another language here, up here, um, became extinct in 1988 with the, uh, the um, Chopi Mapinda was the last speaker and he was murdered. And Nu uh, are now the last three speakers there, and then the entire language family is gone, because these are the last speakers of his entire family. Okay, so um, I'm um, especially being German with our history. Uh, I, I found it very difficult, or still find it difficult, um, in South Africa to talk about uh, race, and it's, uh, but, but uh, you can't avoid, and I, I had to learn that 
not talking about and not recognizing race makes you a racist. So if you don't see color, you are racist. And, and, and this is something very serious, which, which I only learned uh, the hard way uh, two years ago. Um, so you have to distinguish, and, and people insist on being classified. And uh, so the vision of this non-racial society is getting... It's, it's, a, it's, it's a vision which, which I don't know who actually has this vision because people insist in being racially categorized. So the, the question of color, meaning race, uh, and, and language confronts uh, everyone and all spheres are, are, is, is, is there permanently there. So in 1993, when Mandela um, started his campaign for, for the election, um, I was invited to join uh, the group there for two days uh, to, uh, to KwaZulu Natal. Uh, so he is, is the closer speaker, and there is a big uh, division between, uh, divide between uh, Isi Klosa and Isi Sulu. And uh, so the first, language, the first time he spoke in an African language was in Isi Sulu at this occasion. So before that, he used English only. So at this occasion, he tried to convince uh, the Sulu speakers to support uh, the ANC, and he had to use their language. Um, this is quite important. And then the person on the, on the, on the left, who is uh, dressed up in these traditional Sulu uh, dresses, um, he is the long, longest serving minister. So he's still minister, uh, and he was uh, for many years the minister for justice and uh, um, constitutional development, uh, Chef Radebe. Okay, so the, the distribution of, of languages, uh, you see the, the, vast, the, the vast majority, so 22% are, uh, 23% are Isi Sulu, and, uh, and then you see Isi Tosa. Now, just having this list of languages uh, is, is a problem in itself, because this is now the official census. While Isi Sulu is widely, is the standard of Isi Sulu is widely accepted because of the history of Shaga Sulu, who forced everyone to speak basically a standard Sulu. So he was uh, the first one really implementing language policy in, on, on the African continent, as far as I know. So he was like killing others who spoke not his language. And uh, so the, um, and, and, and the, and the difference uh, to Isi Osa is that they, they still today don't accept standard uh, Isi Klosa because it's one of the dialects which was chosen for, for the standard by missionaries, and they developed, and this, uh, so most Isi Klosa don't accept standard. So they, you, and, and you, can, you can go through all those languages. Each of those languages has, has a unique problem. Uh, Sipedi, just to mention one more, Sipedi is only one of 14 dialects of northern Sotho. So this are... Uh, language which is mentioned in the constitution as one of the 11 languages is, is highly disputed because they say this is one dialect of, of northern, uh, so, uh, northern, northern Sotho and it should be replaced and there are there were also legal I mean there are, there are attempts to change this um, okay so just to mention some of those problems uh, now there are population groups um, um, I follow the official conventions of writing black, colored, white with their small letters and Indian with capital. I don't know why, but, but this is how everybody does that. So you, I just follow this. And um, the categories are, these are the official categories used in the census. So people identify themselves according to that. The most problematic category is colored. So there are big movements of so-called Khoisan, who were forced into this category, even though they were not. So their, their movements and the, the ranking, the ranking which is now there is the ranking which is in official jobs. So when you have official jobs at the university, so the priorities are according to this. So if you have a black woman, then she has the top priority, black man second, then Indian woman third, and so on. So colored is third, which I found puzzling because Indians do much better than colored in general. So when I asked, they said it's just reversing the apartheid system. So because the apartheid system was white, colored, Indian, black. So now they just reversed that. So 
be, and now because they realized now, uh, be, that this is somehow odd, two years ago suddenly our university changed. So because I, I was head of linguistics for the last two years, um, and then when we had job uh, adverti advertisements, um, we suddenly had to use black African South African. So there are now black, black African South African and black South African. So black, black African South African are black people speaking African languages. African languages means Bantu languages, which you're not supposed to use in South Africa. Uh, and um, black South African includes now is one category which, which includes black, colored, and Indian. So this is now a way to get around with the Indian being above colored. Now they're in the same category, black, which is, yeah. So this is how things work. And uh, now with the languages, you can't, you can't really talk about white languages and black languages. As you see, Afrikaans is predominantly spoken by colors, not by white. So 50% of the speakers of, of, uh, of Afrikaans is, is, uh, uh, are, are colored. And, um, and English is only 30% spoken by white, while more, you know, about the same 20% uh, are black, uh, colored, and Indian. Now, the provinces, the distribution of languages is also very important because uh, for, for, for the legislation. So these are the nine provinces. And the distribution of languages within these, within these uh, provinces uh, is, is uh, quite interesting because you have uh, language policies which are binding within the provinces. And uh, so the majority languages are usually then the official languages of the provinces in most, in most policies. So you see in the Eastern Cape, the 80% are Isitosa speakers and 10% Afrikaans. English, you see English is in none of the provinces, English is, is, is an important language. So it's, it's, it's only up to 13% um, in, in, in two of the provinces. Uh, and, 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 and you see here all these are... So I mark this because English is always within those official languages. Because all the, all the work, basically, the government works in English. Um, okay. And, and Afrikaans is dominant in two of the provinces, as you see here. Yeah. Here. So they are above, you know, around 50% in, in the Northern Cape and Western Cape. And many of them are basically monolingual in Afrikaans, so they don't speak English, which is quite surprising. I mean, you go there, and you, if you don't speak Afrikaans, you can't communicate. Um, okay, now language status uh, of Afrikaans. Um, I have... You, you, I had to decide, I mean, I, we have to talk about Afrikaans because Afrikaans is the reason for the language policy in place. Uh, so Afrikaans struggled against, I mean, there were these, at that time, they were called Boer, Boers. They, they were fighting against the British dominance, and uh, they were finally defeated in the Second Anglo Boer War, Boer War in, in uh, nine, 1902. And they regained power, political power, in the 20s became the ruling class in their apartheid regime. And uh, after, after the collapse of the apartheid regime, uh, they, they were in negotiations with the, with the, against the English dominance. And um, since 1996, they are one of the official languages. Only one. So when we talk about Afrikaans, we have this image of people like him, like Colonel Jan Breidenbach, uh, who was a, a founding member of this Afrikaans, uh, African Special Forces Brigade. He was uh, um, fighting against uh, so-called terrorists in Angola. And uh, he, so he was one, a very important person in the apartheid regime, so one of the, the terrible people. So, and and uh, Jan Breidenbach, and this is Breiden Breidenbach, his brother. He was in prison put in prison by his brother for poetry. So basically, he wrote poetry in Afrikaans. And um, he, was, um, he was arrested in, in 1975 and was in prison for, for seven years. 
uh, and he was uh, the first two years he was in solitary confinement. Um, finally, they gave him paper, and he wrote the, a book, uh, The True Confession of an Albino Terrorist. <clears throat> and um, so this is something which is very important um, to understand because um, Af Afrikaans, it was also the, the language of, of the liberation. So it was not only the suppression. So he, now it became the language of, of oppressors. It's associated with that because of, of, of their... Uh, of their uh, um, of the upheaval, of this uh, Soviet upheaval where um, there, as, as you all know, the Soviet children uh, uh, were, uh, didn't, didn't accept being taught in Afrikaans and then there were, uh, the police killed many of them. Um, so, but it was, as I just mentioned, also the, the language of, of liberation and, and, and this is an, an important um, aspect to keep in mind. Um, so when we talk about language status, Afrikaans gain status because of political power. The, the national party, the national party became in power, and they focused on Afrikaans. So they developed Afrikaans, and and because of that, you, you got Afrikaans speaking, medium Afrikaans speaking universities established, uh, and. Um, like, there were still four now, till last week, actually, because on 7th of no 17th of November, uh, the, um, the Supreme Court um, decided uh, that um, Stellenbosch could implement its new language policy, which means fading out of Afrikaans as medium of instruction. So they are all now English-speaking universities. All, all universities are now English medium universities. Um, Okay, now we talk. How? I'm, I'm still. Okay. 15 minutes. Okay, good. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, so, with the constitution, are the, there, there are, uh, the language uh, provisions are in, in uh, the founding provisions, which is chapter one, and in the Bill of Rights, which is chapter two. Um, so, um, chapter one is founding provisions, so they are the basics on, of the constitution. And. Um, there are about 600 words in this uh, chapter one, and, uh, and um, more than half are on, on language, just to show how important language is in South Africa. I mean, in the Constitution, it's, it's, a, it's the major point in, the, in, in chapter one of the Constitution. <clears throat> and um, now the subsections are, the first one is a listing, the listing of the 11 languages. One... This uh, constitution was written without linguists being consulted in the actual process of the writing. So there were consultations before, and it developed, but when the constitution was finalized, there were no linguists. So they decided on writing the names of the languages in the orthographies of the, of the languages themselves. So it's like me now, instead of saying German, I would say in my English, I would say Deutsch. You know, this is so, and, and, and this is quite puzzling because you have all these different writing conventions in, in the different, um, and, and so, so the capital lies, you know, the, the prefix of, of Bantu languages. Sometimes it's, it's, it's written in one word, sometimes it's, it's separated, sometimes you see there are all these different, different ways of writing, you know. This is like a prefix. And, uh, actually, this is a pre prefix and a prefix. And, um, so it, 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 it creates a mess, and also for the pronunciation, uh, um, you have an X for, for Isiklosa. This is a lateral click, so Isiklosa, while the X here is Shisonga. You know, so, there are, so if you, if you don't know uh, the words, then uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it's, and, um, and the selection... Of, of those, so which one were selected, the, it reflects basically the apartheid system. It doesn't reflect reality. It, it, it reflects the, the, the apartheid way of, of dividing the society. Which, um, so because they created those Bantustans, and each Bantustan had an official language, and, uh, and those official languages of the Bantustans were then, then became official languages in the new South Africa. 
Uh, that means languages we, which were not officially suppressed during apartheid time are still not acknowledged. For example, Northern Debele. Uh, Siputi is a language I'm now, I started working on Siputi last year, so now I'm, this is one of the languages I'm working on. It's a hybrid language uh, with the Nguni base and uh, Soto influence. And then um, I already mentioned Sipeti, which is only one of 14 Northern Soto languages. Um, so then uh, the, the subsection two is are that basically affirmative action should be directed or di dis, uh, um, distress for, for the previously disadvantaged languages, which means black languages black, spoken by, by, by the black majority. The positioning of this, uh, of this provision is problematic because now following the 11 languages, it doesn't include the ones which are mentioned later. So it should actually be restructured. Uh, so this should follow at the end, you know, um, to, to include all the disadvantaged languages. Um, yeah, that's what I just said. Then, um, then the, the provincial governments, the national governments, they, they are then tasked to account for, uh, they have, they are, uh, are asked to, to have official languages in the provinces. Um, the, so each province has their own, they have their own language policy and also all departments and departments, government departments are about 50. And then all government, all government bodies like uh, national theater, national uh, museums, all those institutions, they all create now their own language policies, which is, and, and with, with very little guidance. So, the, uh, um, so this is a, a, a very problematic thing. And finally, on the, on, the, on the base level, on the local administration level, <coughs> with the municipalities, there is no mentioning of how many languages they need to use. So they can use, choose English or Afrikaans or whatever. So there is no provision made where where it would be the most important thing, because this is where people speak, you know, this is where people are. So, um, then in this, in this provision, there are already the excuses not to implement are already mentioned in the Constitution. So, they actually list already the reasons which are now given by, by provincial governments and institutions why they can't implement 11 languages or other languages. So regional circumstances, practicality, expense, uh, attitudes of, of languages. So, so all these are easy way out for, for, them, um, for the implementation. Um, oh. Um, okay, I, because I'm running out of time, otherwise I'm, I just skip some of this. But but this is uh, the most important thing: is that this is now within the constitution, within this chapter one. You also have provision for the establishment for the, uh, of of a pan South African language board, and this is a very very important um, measure or instrument because this is uh, an independent uh, board. Which is, which is often referred to as a watchdog. They have, they, they are, they are supervising or monitoring whether the government institutions, whether the departments, whether they actually implement uh, the the language policy, and uh, they are also then uh, responsible for language right issues. So if if you complain, you complain uh, to to the pansalp. Pans and um, hmm? so, so PANSALP is, is mandated to promote multilingualism, to develop uh, policies, and also to protect linguistic rights. The Bill of Rights, I just mentioned one, is the education part where you have the right to be educated in any language you want, and uh, as long as it's offered, you know. So, uh, and uh, okay, now the language policy. So Neville Alexander said that a real 
liber a, the, a real uh, new South Africa has to have language policy as a core aspect. And um, so Neville Alexander, um, he, he died in, in August uh, 2012. He, he received the Lingua Pax uh, Award in 2003. And um, he always refused to take, he, he, this is the only award he ever accepted. The, the, so all the South African universities um, offered him uh, uh, awards and he always refused because he said he doesn't want to be singled out. He, he was a, a real revolutionary and he, he said, you know, it's us, the movement, it's not me. And, um, but he accepted uh, Lingua Pax, uh, which, which, um, which I wanted to mention. <clears throat> Anyhow, so um, now this Pansalp, Pansalp uh, the, the language board, um, is, uh, is structured like that. So it has uh, um, a national structure, it has provincial uh, um, boards, bodies, uh, so it's a, quite a complex thing, and this is how their provincial uh, boards then are constituted according to the, uh, uh, the percentage of speakers of each, all, all languages are represented, and uh, one problem is the amendment of 1999, because the PANSALP, uh, this board, was meant to be completely independent under the Senate, in the, in the Constitution, it says it's under the Senate. Now, uh, in 1999, the Minister of, Cult of Arts and Culture managed to amend the Constitution, and, no long, uh, and, and, and he said, replace Senate by minister. So now the minister, who is supposed to be controlled and monitored by Pansalp, is now the one who nominates and dissolves the board which happened in April, because there was uh, a problem with 30 million rand, which were not accounted for. The board wanted to address this with the minister, and the minister didn't talk to them and dissolved them. So since then, there is no board. There, are no, there is no board since, since April last year, because uh, the board members, that this is un unconstitutional, so, so they can't... He can't nominate new one, new members, because there is a case. So you see, one of the basic, the basic institutions to to foster the the implementation of the language policy is now are uh, meaningless with this um, amendment. You know. So okay, I think I'm not able to go through all those. No. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is what, um, so it's now a meaningless instrument. Um, so there are now, um, there was a, um, a report by by uh, agency on, on the performance of the constitution. It was done this year. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't really look at language, uh, but... but uh, in, in, in greater detail, so I was surprised actually they looked at all other aspects in the constitution. It was an, a, an, a, a lengthy report, but uh, they obviously didn't understand that language is it, it's, it's at the very core of, of the problem. So they basically criticized all sorts of or discussed all sorts of aspects. And, um, and then this is what they said about language. Um, so it was part of the, of the compromise that you have these 11 languages, and de facto, it meant that English became the lingua franca. So they are using lingua franca in South Africa for English, which is a wrong term, because the majority of South Africans doesn't speak English. So lingua franca means it's, uh, it's a medium for egalitarian communication. In, in, in South Africa, it's a medium to exclude people, to... English is not a lingua franca at all, you know. So it, it always is featured. Th that's uh, it, it, it's not the one common language. It's the one common language of the elite, you see. So and this is something which is very very important. And then impractical. This is uh, something which uh, comes from monolingual European monolingual mindsets, and it's not it's 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 not something which is which applies to Africa. So. Um, yeah, one important thing is that the constitution 
has these 11 languages. And what they try to do is they try to implement these 11 languages like in bilingual countries where you have Catalan and, and Spanish, whatever. But, but this is a completely different case. For in South Africa, you need to implement multilingualism. You need policies which support multilingualism. So parallel structures. Um, for example, there are soaps where all actors speak in their own languages. They communicate. It's not, di it's not translated. Everybody understands. Everybody understands this kind of communication. So there need to be new ways of, of communication structures need to be developed in order to accommodate the specific situation. I spoke last, last week, I spoke to a, 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 a retired mathematic professor who is now very active in developing new uh, educational strategies at UCT, uh, at the university, uh, in tutorials. So tutorials in the past were only... In, in mathematics, there were only 10% attending those tutorials, and these 10% were the ones who actually didn't need to attend, you know, because they knew already. So they're the ones who really would have benefited, uh, they didn't uh, attend. Now what, what he does is that he has mass uh, tutorials where the medium of instruction, the, 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 the questions are formulated in English, and then it's group work, where they use their own languages, and everybody uses their own languages, and this is where the problem solving is done, and then the presentation is done in English. And, and he says they have excellent results with this because everybody uh, can contribute, um, and uh, they feel like it's, it's their space, and, uh, and, and they feel ownership of this, and, and this kind of very practical, down-to-earth uh, strategies have to be further elaborated and, 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 and uh, developed. And Neville Alexander was at the very core with his pan, uh, pansalb, um, with his presa, where he has reading glasses in townships. Um, so he, every Saturday, he, he, every Saturday he went to, to townships with, with, his, with, their, with his group uh, to, to, uh, um, to read with the children in Isikosa and uh, to, uh, to build up the confident confidence uh, in, in their language. So, so fluency in, in South Africa now, uh, bilingual is, I mean, to be bilingual in South Africa used to be English and Afrikaans. That was bilingual. Now this changed, luckily. So there is, but it changed that Afrikaans basically is, is losing ground. You know? So this is what happens. So, um, um, so English English is spreading in all domains, and there is hardly any resistance against that because of the history, because the, the, the African languages used to be, they were, they were core, core instruments of the divide in, in the apartheid system. So the people were classified and, and separated and excluded on, on the basis of language. And it's a very difficult task, or this needs to be addressed, and, and there need to be a new way of, of communicating this kind of values of African languages. So the only resistance which you find, so the, the Pansalp, before they were dissolved, they received hundreds of uh, ling linguistic right, um, rights complaints. I didn't check through them, because there were there are hundreds. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> but I'm sure that 95% are by Afrikaans. They complain that English is taking over, Afrikaans is suppressed. So, so there, there, are very, there is very few, there is no awareness basically among speakers of African languages that they have a right and, 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 to, and, and that they, they should actually insist that an aggressive policy of implementing um, has to be followed. Um, so uh, to, to end with a more positive uh, statement is that in more recent years there were now these affirmative actions uh, where, which I already mentioned. Now, for example, we had a position for a, a lecturer in linguistics and they, we were told if we don't find a black African South African, we don't get the, we, 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 the money is going to, 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 to be allocated 
to another institute. So we, we had to, so it's this kind of uh, forced, forced uh, empowerment has to be followed in order to make space because there is no way uh, if you just let it go like it is, the elite will continue to exclude the majorities. Um, and um, I don't know, some of you might have, uh, have been aware that the universities, there is a lot of um, strikes and, and uh, discussions and also violence over the last uh, year. Uh, and the discourse is on decolonization. And decolonization also implies uh, getting rid of the white dominance in, in, the, in, in, their, in the universities. And uh, I didn't talk about universities because I, this afternoon when you talk about uh, uh, English dominance, I can then can talk about that topic. Okay, so that's it. And I think it's great to have it.